Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us this Sunday at Walden Community Church. Uh, I want to talk about Passover today. It's the brand new year. We're now in 2022, and I want to talk about Passover. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 22. Uh, there are three different pilgrimage festivals in Judaism, known as the Slash Regalim. We have Passover, we have Shavu, which is the festival of weeks. We have Sukkot, which is the festival of tents or booths. And they're called pilgrimage festivals because the Israelites who are living in ancient Israel and Judea, they would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem in order to celebrate them. New Year is often a time for resolutions. And it's a time for new starts and new beginnings. And so let's also talk about new life. I want to talk about new life. The Christian should be all about new life. And so it seemed fitting that this is what we would talk about at the beginning of 2022. In Israel, Passover is a seven-day holiday of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, with the first and last days observed as legal holidays, holy days. And you observe them by saying a special prayer, eating a special meal, and not going to work. <laughs> Passover is the celebration. It's the reminder of the story of Exodus, the children of Israel, captive in Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh won't release the Hebrews, so God sends 10 plagues on the Egyptian people, and the last one was death. And so to prevent the Hebrews from suffering, God gave uh, Moses and Aaron these instructions. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. Passover begins on the 15th day of the month of Nisan, which typically falls for us March, April. Verse 5 says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill the lamb at twilight. So there's a couple rules there, right? Some stipulations. The lamb has to be without defect, and the entire congregation, all the people, are responsible for the death. And third, the lamb should be killed at twilight or, or dusk. Verse 7 says, Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with the unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head and its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And notice, lastly, none of it is left for the morning. And those of them who are covered in the blood of the lamb are saved. That first night in Egypt, death came to the firstborn of all Egypt, except for those who were in a household covered in blood. The verb for Passover, Pesach, means he passed over, literally. So this holy day is the observance when God withheld death, the people were spared, and they were spared because of a lamb. God allowed death to pass over because a lamb was killed and the blood of that lamb covered that household and all those inside. We're on the same page, right? I thought so. <laughs> so then we skip ahead a few books and a few hundred years to the time of Jesus and we see the Passover now take on a new meaning. Luke 22 verse 7 says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will we have us prepare it? Remember, this is the pilgrimage festival. Jesus is asking them to find a room on the day, <laughs> right? On the day of. This is gonna be like trying to find dinner reservations for Valentine's Day on Valentine's Day. It's impossible, right? 
You thought our church was packed on Christmas Eve? The city is more packed. Verse 10, he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it, just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, you and I, what we're thinking is, yeah, a name would be helpful. Like, <laughs> go find a guy carrying a jar of water. Ooh, what's his name? Just give us his name, right? How, just finding any random guy in a crowded city? Well, ordinarily, it would be a woman carrying a jar of water. If there was water to be fetched, that was a woman's job. So seeing a man carrying a jar of water, that would have stood out in a crowd. Verse 15, Jesus says to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. Luke is the only one who records the first cup. And in the traditional Passover meal, this cup is the first blessing. It's given as a toast. It's like saying a toast at the beginning of a meal. And following the opening blessing came the dipping of the bitter herbs. And then you pour a second glass of wine. And then that is drank. Then, similar to how you and I, we might read uh, Toys the Night Before Christmas on Christmas Eve, the Hebrews sing a song. They sing a song called the Hallel, and it comes from Psalm 113 and Psalm 114. It's a retelling of all the Passover events. Then they would bless the bread and pass it. Verse 19, and he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after the bread, they would have the main course. That would be the lamb and a third cup of wine. Verse 20 says, And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that has been poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Then each one would drink from a common cup, and afterwards they would recite Psalm 115 to 118, and then they would have one more cup of wine. And after dinner you would sing a hymn, which Mark 14 continues in verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so, even today, much of the Passover meal is still retained, and these rituals and these observances, they are still practiced by modern-day Jews. As Christians, this observance is called the Lord's Table, or Communion, or the Eucharist, or the Common Table. In our church, as well as others, this practice is elevated to something that we call an ordinance. An, an ordinance is a church ritual that we believe has value. Our church actually has two ordinances, as do most churches, and we'll talk about the other one. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 11 why we observe this ordinance. When Jesus had given thanks, he broke bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So unlike the Jews who celebrate Passover to remember that God passed over the people in Egypt, Christians now celebrate this with a new meaning, and we remember the Lord's death. And Jesus said earlier in verse 20 of Luke 22 that this was now a new covenant. But that phrase should just be ringing a little bell in your head and making you think, okay, what, what, is, what is a covenant? Well, what is a new covenant? And what was the old covenant? This covenant had to do with the peace offering that God made in Exodus 24. After Moses reads the book of the covenant to the people of Israel, which is more of like saying, you know, the Ten Commandments and then all the rules that went along with that, the Bible says, then he, Moses, took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of all the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. 
So Moses reads the law. He reads all the conditions of the law, which is about three chapters in your Bible. And the people all agree. They, you know, put their hand on it and swear. They say, yes, we will do this. And then blood is thrown on them. And they are covered in the blood as a sign of the agreement. But then you skip ahead. And we have Jesus, and he's eating with his disciples, and he takes elements like bread and wine, and he symbolically makes them flesh and blood for a new agreement. But just giving a holiday meal a new meaning, that doesn't make it a covenant. The Bible says in order for a covenant to be made, blood has to be involved. Leviticus 17 says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So wine does not become blood. That doesn't make a new covenant because life comes from blood. And in order for a new covenant to be made, something has to die. And notice, Jesus seems to be dropping some hints about all of this. Jesus says at the meal, this is my last Passover with you. And he seems to imply that at next year's Passover, he won't be there because he says, do this in remembrance of me. So somewhere between the Last Supper and today, something happened that made the communion table become an important observance. Because we don't take communion to remember the day Jesus had his last Passover, right? We're not celebrating Passover when we take communion. Paul says we take communion to proclaim the Lord's death. Communion is a reminder of the cross. You see, hundreds of years before Jesus came on Christmas morning, God was already establishing a family tradition of people gathering around a common table, and that table was filled with symbols of all the things that were to come. What happened on the cross was a moment that changed the world forever, and it tipped the balance between God and humanity so that when it happened, God wanted to make sure that nobody would miss it. So he had been planting these seeds for generations in people's minds. Check it out. When Jesus first steps out onto the stage, for the very first time, the curtains part, and and his cousin stands back and introduces him to the world. And the first thing that is said about him is, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And from that moment on, Jesus is the Passover Lamb. And we touched on this for the past couple weeks. And so if Jesus is the Passover lamb, and if Jesus tells his disciples that his flesh and blood are the instruments of the new covenant, then there has to be evidence of that. There is. There is evidence of that. At his Roman trial, Jesus has brought to Pilate, and he is accused by who? The people, right? The crowds. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Remember, the entire congregation is responsible for killing the Passover lamb. Verse 3, Pilate asked them, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. Remember, the Passover lamb is also to be what? Perfect and without blemish, without defect. Is there more? Is there more evidence? Yes, we keep reading. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land, until the ninth hour, when the sun's light failed. How? does sunlight fail, right? The sixth hour of the day is noon, noon. But because the Passover lamb is supposed to be killed at dusk, 
God said, you know what, I'm just going to make it dusk right now so that you don't miss this symbol. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And then Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw that what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. Nothing in the Bible happens by accident. Everything is God's design. Why did it have to happen this way? Because it's all a symbol of the Passover table. And it's all a symbol of the sacrifice of the lamb. This is Passover week. So all of these images right now should be fresh in everyone's mind. And God didn't want anyone to miss this moment. Oh, and look at this. The gospel uh, in John, look at what John records. Since it was the day of preparation, and so the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead and did not break his legs. I know. Why is that important? Well, because of the rules that surround Passover. Numbers 9 says, You shall eat the lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until the morning, nor break any of its bones. According to all the statute for the Passover, they shall keep it. So when Jesus breaks bread and passes the cup with his disciples, he tells them directly, this is going to be a new covenant. And this familiar meal that we all share, this holiday will now have a brand new meaning. From this moment on, Jesus says, you won't celebrate Passover to remember Egypt. You will do this now to remember me. And that's what we do. That's what we do here at Walden Church. Communion is a remembrance of what Jesus did. Communion is a remembrance of what Jesus did. John Wesley said, I am to show that it is the duty of every Christian to receive the Lord's Supper as often as they can. We partake to remember because it was a command of Christ. Plus this command was given by Jesus just hours before he died. They are quite literally his dying words to all of us. Communion is a memorial, and we find memorials all through life. Our church has memorials. There are stones and plaques that highlight a moment or a person that helped the church in some way, and the church felt this person deserves recognition. And it's because of memorials that we will always know that B.B. Graves helped purchase Sunday school furniture, that Flo Locke helped purchase pews, that Mary Campbell helped purchase stained glass windows, that Jack Trend gave us the communion table. There are memorials in Scripture. After the flood, God established his memorial, this promise that he would never again destroy the world by a flood. The rainbow is a visual reminder of God's covenant with Noah. When Abraham came and established a relationship with God, through the memorial of circumcision. It was a physical act, and it was a symbol of being set apart. Spiritual purity, communion, is a reminder of the teachings of Jesus and his death. When we hold the bread, right, we are reminded that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. When we hold the cup, we are reminded that Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Memorials are important because they serve as beacons, not just to us to remember, but even those who are too young to remember. After the Israelites crossed the Jordan River, they took 12 stones and they built a memorial. And the book of Joshua records why that's important. He says that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Memorials become teaching moments. 
That's why when we celebrate communion, the children should always be invited to participate. Why? Well, because we believe that these moments are something that they should also observe. Some things that are important, we need children to see. The bread and cup is not a meal. It's a remembrance of the life of Christ. Second, communion is a new covenant forged in blood. Communion is a remembrance of what Jesus did, what he said, and his death on the cross. As Paul says, we don't remember this just to remember his death, but his death was not meaningless. It wasn't a magic trick. His death was important because it was the perfect blood that had to be shed in order to establish a new covenant. The author of Hebrews says Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant that mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Verse 13 says he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. In other words, the Exodus covenant was already broken because it relied so heavily on us being perfect people. The Israelites said, yeah, we can do all that stuff, and if we do all that stuff, we have to obey the law. That's what they agreed to. Right? That's what they agreed to when they said, you will be our God and we will be your people. They said, yeah, we can do all that stuff. We'll obey. But they couldn't. They couldn't. So every single year, a lamb had to be sacrificed. Blood had to be shed so that the punishment would keep being removed. Under the old covenant, God lived in a box. He lived behind a curtain. He lived in a temple. And nobody was allowed to go in there. Nobody was worthy. Nobody was clean. Nobody was perfect. We couldn't come into God's presence. He was not accessible. Remember earlier we said the sky went dark. Right? The sky goes dark. The temple curtain is torn in two. And the author of Hebrews says, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. What does that mean? It means God doesn't live somewhere on a cloud or in a box. He's not a wizard behind a curtain. The new covenant allows us into the presence of God regardless of our past. 1 John 1 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. The covenant of Jesus, his blood, not only gives us free access to each other in fellowship, but it also allows us to have access with God. His blood, this new covenant, cleanses us from all sin. The Latin word, Eucharist, it means giving thanks. We give thanks. But when you break the word down, its etymology is much more interesting. It's actually made up of two words. You means good, and charis means grace. Good grace. 2022 is going to start with a lot of promise. The new year always brings resolutions, hope, dreams about new life. But what do you really need this year? As the year begins, what do you, what do you really need? You need a new job? You need more money? You need to lose weight? See, to accomplish any new resolution, the work is all on you. That's why we fail (laughs) at all of them. We fail because our habits that we already have, they're already so well-worn in us. And so any new tradition that we try to add to our life, it gets outvoted by our old life. A new habit takes 21 days to develop. Memorization usually begins on the 30th and 40th time you read it and see it. This is why gym memberships skyrocket at the beginning of the year and then always taper off. Self-improvement is hard. That's why we have the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And then what happens when we fail? We beat ourselves up. We call ourselves names. 
we shake our head and we pull our hair and we say, I can't do anything right. This always happens to me. I can't believe it. This is so typical of my life. I think next year we all need some good grace. Don't we? There is good news in good grace. Jesus did all the work on the cross. None of us could ever be a perfect lamb. None of us could ever be without defect. We all have our baggage. We all carry our own darkness. And that keeps us tied down. And what Jesus did was he set us free so that we could live in forgiveness forever. The cross is un merited favor, unmerited favor. It's blessing, it's forgiveness. It's the slate wiped clean. And it is the key to a fresh new life. Don't you want a new life in 2022? Don't you want a new life next year? I would invite you to be a part of this community or any local church so that you can be a part of communion. I mean, sure, I've, I've taken communion to people's homes and I'm glad to do it, but communion is a communal meal. It's a community meal. We take it together. It strengthens us as a congregation. It binds us together. You become a minister you become an evangelist when you hold that cup, when you hold that bread, you preach a sermon to everyone who's watching you. You are saying to those around you, this is what I believe. This is important to me. The flesh and blood of Christ are real. They are lasting. They are true and, and solid and, they are, and the cross is real and the cross and Jesus' life and his blood, that is the only way to God. I know the world around you says there are many ways to find God, many ways to find peace, many ways to be forgiven. The world is lying to you. The world is not looking out for your best interests. Jesus came to be the perfect sacrifice. He came to be the perfect lamb for you. He came to take away all your sin and all your darkness so that you could have new life. I invite you, if you do not know Jesus as your personal savior, that next year, this year, this year, right? In 2022, you would seek him out. Seek Jesus with all your heart. I promise you will find him. Let's pray together. Lord, you have put new life in all of our hearts and you have satisfied our hunger with good things. And as you give all, you do not withhold anything from us. And as we observe, that also included your son. If you gave all, how can we withhold anything from you? because you are our Lord and God. We ask that in this year, you would renew us day by day. Continue to send us the gift of your spirit and allow us to give ourselves completely to you through service. Help us to walk in joy. Help us to walk in the footsteps of our master, Jesus Christ. And most importantly, thank you for good grace. Amen. Again, I want to remind you, we are here. The pews, they are, they are here for you. We have a space for you. We want to see you once again. We have two services every Sunday, 9.30 and 11. 9.30 is our traditional service. We have a choir. We sing hymns. 11 o'clock is our contemporary service. We have a worship team, and uh, it's also the time where we have a children's program. We also have a youth group. Our youth group also meets on Wednesdays at 6.00. We would love to have your uh, son or daughter come by. It's open from uh, middle school all the way through high school. Uh, We have uh, a program for each. 
And so we want them to come. Uh, we'll feed them dinner. We will feed them dinner on Wednesdays. You can send them over on their bikes or their skateboards or they can walk, right? We're so close, you can walk over. I love you guys. I'll see you next week.